it's episode 76 of the Keto for Women show. You're listening to the Keto for Women show, and I'm your host and nutritionist, Sean Miner. This show is designed to empower women to find their own expression of the keto diet to maximize their health and happiness. Now let's get started with today's episode. Hey, hey friends, welcome back. Thanks as always for joining me on this episode of Keto for Women. We have another Keto Hot Seat episode for you, all of your questions being answered by me. I think I got these questions, gosh, like two months ago now. I'm trying to get through them as quickly as I can so I can ask for more, but went through today's questions and we have some really good topics. I hope I can get through a bunch of them for you so that we can cover a variety of things today. But first, just a few quick announcements. It is Black Friday today. And if you are anything like me, then you are not shopping on Black Friday, at least not in the stores. I personally cannot stand crowds on a regular day, let alone on Black Friday, and it is never worth the deal that I could potentially get to handle those crowds. But since it's Black Friday, that also means that yesterday was Thanksgiving, at least for those of us in the U.S., And I just want to, I guess, give maybe a little bit of a reminder or some tips around this time of year. We're going to be talking more about this in the upcoming episodes too. This holiday season can really get some of us into this weird kind of mindset place and into a bad spot about food and our bodies and the relationship we have with both. And so we're just going to take it back a notch and remember what we're actually here to do, which is to get healthy, to find a lifestyle that works for us for the long term so that we can get that health now and in the future. And so if that means that maybe you had an extra piece of pie yesterday, maybe you're going to have a piece of pie for your leftovers today, just remember how important important the mentality around that is. So around the foods that you're eating right now and as we move forward into the holiday season, we don't have to beat ourselves up. We don't have to feel bad if we accidentally ate something that, you know, we're now not really all that excited that we ate. We don't have to regret it. We don't have to feel bad about ourselves. We don't have to beat ourselves up. We don't have to have any of that negative emotion because it's done. It's over. So if yesterday it was Thanksgiving, you got caught up in the moment, maybe you had some things that now you're like, man, I really didn't want that. I kind of made a decision out of habit or out of stress and not out of truly 100% intuition and really wanting that it's okay. You are learning from that experience. That's part of this whole process. We all have those moments. We all go through it. So I just want to use that as a learning experience and not something to get yourself back into this hole where then now it can easily spiral out of control. And then today you have those extra pieces of pie and tomorrow you have some other sorts of things that you know won't work for you. And it just keeps going and going and going. And from there, now we're just going to do that until Christmas. And then we'll wait until the new year. And this is really the time that I see all of this just kind of start unraveling. And it doesn't have to be that way, but you also don't have to be 100% strict with yourself either. You can find this happy place and it's all because of intuition. It's all because of learning about your body and listening to your body. So you can really decide if, you know, maybe Thanksgiving is really important to you. Maybe Christmas is really important to you. And the food that is surrounding those holidays really means something, or they're your favorite foods, or they're your grandma's famous recipe, or whatever the case. And you really want that food. The joy and happiness and just that warm feeling that comes from making that decision to have that food, even though it may not be something you normally eat on a regular basis, that's really important and powerful information. And that's really coming from the right place. That has a lot of backing behind it because you made that decision intentionally. You 
are really choosing, you know, that health and happiness kind of pendulum that I talk about so often, you're choosing the happiness and that's totally fine. And it's not going to derail your health to have one meal on Thanksgiving that's not going to necessarily be the best thing ever for your health you're trying to gain. One meal is not going to make a huge negative dent in what you're trying to do. The happiness will take over and that's just as important to our health overall. So I just want to give you a little bit of a pep talk. And if you're in that place where you didn't make a great choice, cool. Use it as a learning experience. As we move on, we have a whole month of learning experiences ahead of us. And it'd be interesting to see if we can take what happened yesterday, if it was something that you weren't intending or you didn't have that intuition in your back pocket, what can you learn from that? And what can maybe you take from that into Christmas time? And use that to your advantage now and maybe learn to be a little bit more intuitive when it comes to holidays and making those choices and having these foods around that you're used to eating out of habit or out of tradition, but maybe they're not appealing to you anymore. Maybe you don't actually want those foods if you take a moment to think about it. And a lot of you may not be feeling good today, like actually physically not feeling great, stomach aches, headaches, things like that. If you did go and have some extra dessert or whatever you don't normally do, that also is a learning experience. You know, if you want to feel like that the day after Christmas, then great. And that's a really good intuitive choice. No one's faulting you for that. But now it may be a case where, geez, I really don't want to feel like this ever again. So that's really not worth it. I think I could make some substitutions or try something else, maybe find a new recipe and go from there. So just wanted to give that little bit of pep talk today since it is the day after Thanksgiving, which also means we're 100% in the holiday zone. And so we'll talk about this more kind of over the next few weeks as we go, as it comes up, because I do want to make sure that we're all on the same page with our holiday plans. And just remember, no judgment in either case. If you want to go for it, I'm all about that. If you want to stay 100% keto, awesome, obviously, but you also can be somewhere in between, which I know a lot of people, at least in the Fat Burning Female Project, are doing. We chatted about that this week, and there's a lot of room to wiggle within that. So find your sweet spot. Use it as a tool for next time, too. All right, we're going to keep it short and sweet for announcements today so we can move on to these questions and hopefully get a bunch of them done. Now, quickly, before I get into the questions, I want to give a little bit of a preview of some changes that may be coming to our Keto Hot Seat episodes. Last week, I talked about the changes that are happening when I do have a one-on-one episode where I'm talking about a specific topic. I'm going to keep those short and sweet. They're going to be to the point. We're going to figure out the answer and move on. So that will be more like 30 to 45 minutes of me chatting away. With these Keto Hot Seat episodes, we are still going to do them. I love doing them. I love getting your questions. I am going to just have a little bit more structure to them. So I will be bringing in a co-host at least I'm considering her a co-host, to help me kind of read the questions, break down what everyone is asking. Like a lot of times there's multiple questions in one question. And so I want to have someone else to kind of help me organize the questions and be able to make sure I'm answering them succinctly. And it will help, I think, with my flow to have someone else. Basically, what she's going to be is the listener. So she's going to take it from a listener view. If I don't quite answer the question or that answer brought up another question, she will be basically you and ask that question so that I can get to the point and really make sure that I'm truly answering the questions for you. So I'm really excited about that. We are in the process of scheduling that. So that'll happen over the next few hot seat episodes and it'll be fun. I think you guys will like it. I think it will provide a lot more the ability, I think, to get through a lot more questions for me. It's very hard to be the one reading the questions, trying to figure out exactly what they're saying and asking, and then answering them succinctly and trying to move on and then getting on my tangents, which you know I all do. 
which you all know that I do, and this will really help with that. And I think it's just fun to meet someone new and hear a new voice and have some interaction between another person. I mean, you guys obviously understand that I'm talking to myself right now and just visualizing you guys out there listening, but it does get a little hard to talk to myself for an hour a day every week. So this will mix things up there a little bit. So I can't wait for y'all to meet her and get to know her as we go. So this will be probably the last one that I will be reading and answering at the same time. But let's get going with these questions. First one is a great one, and there were actually several people who wanted the answer to this question. I love your show. Thank you for all the info. The thing is, and I swear I'm not throwing shade, sometimes I get frustrated listening to you. Please let me explain. You recommend all grass-fed products and have vehemently disagreed with the idea that conventional meat is good for us because of the omega-6, omega-3 ratio. I get this, but I'm a stay-at-home mom, a wife, and frankly, we're not swimming in cash. I would love if you would dedicate an episode to getting healthy on a budget. I know I can trust you to have better advice than you can pay for it now or you can pay for it in medical bills, like we hear everyone else say. I'm just tired of health experts implying that my financial incapacity to spend hundreds of dollars a week makes me a bad mom. Yes, I totally get this. I do have more answers for you. Don't worry. I get it. And I actually would like to dedicate a whole episode to this and not just talking about food quality, but talking about other things too, because it really is expensive to make your house non-toxic and, you know, have the best organic sheets and all these things really adds up. So there's more that we can do besides just food to also be healthy on a budget. Of course, food is a big one. So we'll talk about that today. And then maybe I will in the future, near future, have an episode dedicated to just overall health on a budget because there are plenty of things you can do. The first thing that I want to say as it relates specifically to food is that no matter what you subscribe to as far as your eating style, whether it's keto, paleo, vegan, whatever it may be, for you and your family, it will always be the best thing health-wise and the best thing budget-wise to eat real food. Just get the real food, skip the processed food. You will always find better deals, more sale items, get more bang for your buck, more food for your buck to shop the perimeter. So to get to the butcher counter, go through the produce sections, go through the freezer aisles, maybe even for some of the, you know, frozen veggies and things, but stay away from those processed meats, the packaged meats, the packaged processed food in the aisles, that stuff, while it may seem like it's more affordable for what you're actually getting and for how many servings it will be, it's really not. It's really not. You will save a bunch of money by not using those things. And I don't know if you do or not. This is just a general recommendation for anybody who is still picking up the convenience foods. And yeah, they're convenient. It's great. But if you're on a budget, then you're going to have to meal prep a little bit and you're going to have to do a little bit more cooking in order to save yourself money. And then from there, there's a good chance that you may be able to occasionally buy some grass-fed beef when it's on sale or some organic vegetables when they're on sale and really see how that difference actually happens by getting out of those aisles and just shopping for real food. So that's my number one thing that will immediately help. The next thing is, yes, for me, Meat is really important for me to get the highest quality I absolutely can. If I were budgeting a little bit further, then I would still select the highest quality of meat that I could, and I would sacrifice maybe some organic vegetables. Right now, I eat 100% organic, and I would maybe not do that if I were trying to cut back my expenses. That is something that I would do. Now you have to figure out what works best for you. It's always going to be a case of you doing your best, you figuring out what you can and can't afford, and also what you do and don't care about the most. So prioritize 
what you are looking for, what's most important to you. If it is meat and you're like me, then it may be worth it to spend the extra $50 a month to get the grass fed and then make up for that elsewhere. Try to find some savings in some other places or other types of foods or even other parts of your life that you could take that money out. And I know it's really hard, especially when you're on a budget, it feels like every cent matters and there's really nothing that you can take away at all. But maybe it's just a different allocation that could happen within your food budget. If you can't, go grass-fed, grass-finished beef, then just try to get the best that you can. Do your best. Find some that's organic. Find some that's just grass-fed. Go to Costco or Sam's and get it in bulk. The best tip that I have for you when it comes to meat is to find a local farmer or butcher that will sell it to you potentially in a bulk package. So a lot of people I know who are on a tight budget, they will buy a quarter of a cow, a half a cow, and put it in the freezer and have it for like the year. And that really, really saves a ton of money per pound if you can do it that way. And you're getting a local, really good, high quality meat. You know that that cow was in a happy place for its life and you're supporting the local economy, which is also great. So as long as you have a spot in your freezer or you have an extra freezer, hopefully, which I've heard stories of people that even with buying a freezer, like one of those kind of garage freezers, I can't think of the name of them right now. They have a specific name, but even with buying one of those and buying a quarter or half a cow, they still saved money than just going to the store and buying ground beef per pound. They still saved money even with that freezer purchase. So that's something that you could look into too. And even if you can't do the big bulk purchase, there are a lot of farmers, and this was the case for me and and where I go to get my meat locally, they'll just sell it to you. I basically sign up for a community supported meat share and I get a pound a week for the summer. So they kind of do it in a bulk package, but I pay for it up front. So you may be able to find something like that also where you do have to put a little bit of money up front, but it's saving you so much over the long term. I really think that if you just do some research and everybody can go to Google, just start Googling, you know, local farmers in your area and you can do the same thing for produce. Again, community supported agriculture. So you can look up that, you can look up CSA in your area, you can find these farmers who will basically provide the majority of the produce that you need, at least for part of the year at a very good cost. And again, you are getting really good, high quality organic vegetables from a place you know exactly what they're doing and their practices. You can see them and even meet them. And you're supporting, again, the local industry. So those are my two biggest tips for sure is get out of the box, get out of the box of grocery store and go into more of a a local type setting and see what you can do there. Now, another tip as it relates to produce is to, like I said, if you can get some things that are organic, that would be really great. And then there's some things that you can bypass the organic, get the cheaper version, and you'll be fine. You can find the list of these, the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. I think probably most of you have heard of these before. The Dirty Dozen are the 12 types of produce that you should definitely get organic because they are highly sprayed with pesticides and Roundup and things like that. The Clean 15 are the 15 types of produce that are not usually sprayed heavily that you can bypass getting organic. If you need to be on a budget, you'll be just fine. Usually they're the ones that have some sort of peel or something. So you're going to be peeling off the part that was treated anyway, and you'll still be good to go. So take a look at those. You can, again, Google that, or I'll make sure to put a link to those in the show notes for this episode. So you can find that quickly and just start there. Maybe start with that maybe look into and see if frozen vegetables are a better way for you to go with your budget. But no matter what, my two biggest things, eat real food and bypass those convenience foods in this aisles and do your best. 
Just do your best. You're not a bad mom. You would never be a bad mom for trying your best and doing what you can do within your means. That's all you can do. Even if it's once a month that you buy grass-fed beef. Awesome. That's great. That's once a month more than you were perhaps doing before. That is all you need to do. Just take it one step at a time and you'll be good to go. All right, moving on. Insulin resistance versus adrenal fatigue. Ooh, I love this question already. Which is more important to tackle first? I've been intermittent fasting 16 hours most days with the occasional 24-hour fast to help bring my insulin levels down for the past 18 months. I had a salivary cortisol test last year and my cortisol is wonky, low in the morning, but highest as I'm trying to sleep. I drag myself out of bed every day, even with 10 to 12 hours of sleep. I don't know which is more important to focus on. I've been keto for two years, work out with weights three to four days per week. My fasted insulin was at 45 and it's now down to around nine. All right. This is amazing. Great question. Thank you so much. First of all, to get your fasting insulin down from 45 to nine is amazing. So congratulations. I hope you're celebrating that. I hope you're spending some time being really, really proud of yourself for being able to do that and not just, you know, continuing to push, push, push. Of course, we still want to get that a little bit lower in the future, but just celebrate that. That's some amazing progress, girl. But great question, and I really think there's a couple different answers. First of all, it will be pretty much impossible to completely become insulin sensitive and get this really great fasting insulin number while you still have adrenal fatigue. They are extremely interconnected and interwoven, and blood sugar issues will continue to keep your adrenals taxed. And your adrenals being taxed will continue to promote blood sugar issues. That is a cycle. So in my opinion, and, you know, very educated opinion, I would say, you want to work on your adrenals first. The cool thing is that you can work on your adrenal fatigue and healing your adrenals and balancing that cortisol back out to be in a normal rhythm while also working on your insulin resistance. A lot of the tools that you would use for your adrenals, you would also use for your insulin sensitivity or for getting your blood sugar in check. So really you're going to be doing both at the same time, but you're going to be doing both with the intention of getting that cortisol into its normal pattern, giving your adrenals a rest, and that will very, very quickly lead to the blood sugar readings that you want. So how do we do that? Healing your adrenals takes really good sleep. Healing insulin resistance also takes really good sleep. And right now you aren't really getting that because your cortisol is spiking at night when you're trying to sleep. So even if you are falling asleep, you're not getting good quality sleep. So that's a one really good thing that you need to make sure to address quickly. So you should be taking some maybe magnesium, maybe drinking some tea before bed, getting into a really good sleep habit where you are basically preparing for sleep before you even get into bed. So you should be putting on blue blocker glasses and potentially not looking at any technology for, you know, an hour or so before bed, doing some sort of stress relieving techniques before bed, like meditation, deep breathing, maybe some yin yoga, something like that, getting into bed and really creating a bridge between life and dreams is kind of how I like to think of it. So for me, that's something like reading or again, the meditation, talking to your partner, something like that, where you kind of have this way to start winding down from everything that happened over the day and putting that on the back burner so that you can sleep. Because if we turn off the light and we're still ruminating about all the things that happened all day, it's going to take a while to get to sleep and that will cause that cortisol to stay spiked up. So we have really good sleep hygiene and that's going to help your adrenals big time and also help your insulin resistance. 
Before we move on with this episode, just a quick reminder to go ahead and check out our Keto for Women sponsor, Fat Fuel Company, over at fatfuelcompany.com. They are making pre-packaged little pouches of our fatty drinks that we know and love, like our fatty coffees, our fatty cocos with the MCT oil powder and the coconut oil powder and grass-fed butter powder, all with organic coffee or organic cocoa. That's it. The ingredients are really simple. And all you have is just a pouch that you put in some hot water, you whip it up, and it is the best tasting little hot drinks that you can have. They are great to take with you to work or on a trip, just whenever you know you're going to be needing that extra fat in your keto diet and you want to make it really easy. You don't want to have to worry about taking all the ingredients and all the coffees and all that stuff. All you need now with the help of Fat Fuel Company is a spoon and some hot water. It's so easy. I want to make sure you give it a try. You can head to fatfuelcompany.com. Use the coupon code KETO, the number for women, for 20% off your order. That will be at the Amazon checkout. Once you have gotten all of the stuff you want to try from Fat Fuel Company in your cart, make sure you add that coupon code to your Amazon order for 20% off. You guys are going to love it. They are great snacks. They're great breakfasts. You just want to have them around just for all those inconvenient times where you need more fats or you just want something warm. That's fatfuelcompany.com. The second thing, which you're doing already, but we want to make sure we're doing appropriately is working out. If you have blood sugar issues and I just want to quick side note here. I just got done doing the Better Blood Sugar Project with my fat burning female ladies, and we tested all their blood sugar markers. We tested fasting glucose, fasting insulin, HbA1c, and fructosamine. And there were so many ladies that had great of the three markers, so great fasting glucose, great HbA1c, great fructosamine, but their insulin was high their fasting insulin was much higher than the functional lab range. And not surprisingly at all, I knew this was going to happen, which is why I wanted to do this course in the first place. Those that were dealing with an increase in their fasting insulin, so higher fasting insulin than the functional lab range, which by the way is from two to five, also were experiencing weight loss resistance. They were keto for blah, blah, blah amount of time, doing everything right, working out, all this stuff, but they still had high insulin. So this is just total side note. I wanted to make sure to mention that because that could be something that is also going on with you. So if you don't know your insulin levels, you haven't had them tested in a while or ever, and you're experiencing you know, maybe not the results you thought you would with keto, get your insulin tested. Don't just go by your fasting blood sugar readings or even your postprandial you know, those after meal blood sugar readings either. So make sure you're getting the full picture. And I'm really glad I did that project for those ladies so they could finally understand what was going on with their bodies. But I wanted to mention that because that means that there's more women dealing with this than we think or know because we haven't gotten that tested yet. So just my side note there, let's get back to what I was saying because anybody who has high insulin needs to work out. So this means that not only those people that know they have high insulin need to work out, but also those of you that don't know that yet, and maybe you won't know that for a while. So how about we all just work out? That would be great. (laughs) That was really what I was trying to get to by that whole long story. But anyway, you're working out three to four days a week with weights. That is amazing. That's awesome. That is really probably a major factor in getting your fasting insulin down from 45 to nine. So really great job. Proud of you for that. But we do want to make sure there is a very kind of fine line between workouts being perfect and great for your body and great for your adrenals and great for your blood sugar levels and being a little too much or too little 
and not being great for your adrenals and your blood sugar levels. So really the best way to go about this, I think, is to kind of get on this scale of perceived exertion. That's all we need to do. We need to see what it feels like when we work out. And I would say for the case of adrenal fatigue and insulin resistance together, you'd probably want to get on a perceived exertion of like six to eight most of your workouts. So that means four, three to four days a week, you are feeling like you've gotten to a six, a seven, or an eight out of 10, where 10 being like, oh my gosh, I am going to pass out. <laughs> and one being like, you're sitting on the couch. So you really want to get to that upper level where you are putting some exertion on your body, where you are challenging your fitness level to some degree, but not so much that it's causing this stress response that we can't get out of, especially when we have this adrenal situation already going on. So it sounds like you're doing a really great job. Just make sure that you're right in that zone and that will continue. And then we also really need to work on our stress to relieve our adrenal fatigue and get us back into this really nice curved cortisol response that we want to have throughout the day, which starts off high in the morning and low at night. And right now yours is in reverse. You've got to figure out your stress levels. You've got to figure out your stress response and where that's coming from. So really start digging into some of the reasons why you might be stressed. Of course, we cannot take away all of the stressors of our life. It would be great if we could because we'd all be a heck of a lot healthier, but we can't. However, we can reduce them. We can reframe them which I think is the more important factor and the harder one to do, but the one that makes a really big impact is just seeing what you can do to think about that differently. So it's not going to go away, but how can you not absorb it the same way, not take it on the same way, not let it affect you in the same way? That's what really, really makes a big difference and makes it so that, yeah, you can have stress, but how you're dealing with it has taken on a whole new meaning and it's not impacting your body and your adrenals and your cortisol levels anymore. That's what we really want to go for. And again, can't get rid of all the stress, but we can also do things to mitigate that. So yeah, we have stress in our lives, but we also have times of complete de-stress, which is in that parasympathetic mode, that rest and digest mode. And that would come by doing the things I mentioned, even in your before bed ritual, like meditation, deep breathing, getting into an infrared sauna, taking a bath, having a nice conversation with someone you love, snuggling your pets. You know, there's a bunch of things that you can do to really get into that nice, calm mode. And that should be something that you are doing every single day. Even if it's one minute, if that's all you have for the day, that's better than zero. If you can get up to five or 10 minutes, that would be amazing. But that's really going to help boost up those adrenals and reduce your insulin and get your blood sugar back to this normal little mini roller coaster. I like to think of it. So you can see that all of those things, the three things that I just mentioned, of course there's more, I'm just trying to be succinct here. There's definitely a lot more things that you can do for your adrenals and for your insulin, but those are some really great starting places for you to focus on. They will work to do both. By working and focusing on your adrenals, you are also working and focusing on your insulin resistance. So you can do both. The only thing that I would recommend you taking out or reducing is that fasting. So as we know, if you are fasting when you are adrenally taxed, then it is going to continue that trend because not eating for a 24-hour period of time is going to induce a stress response in your body. There's no way around it. And if you are really balanced with your adrenal health and your cortisol levels are great, then having that little bit of stress isn't going to be a big deal. You're going to be able to bounce back from that. But if you're not there yet, then it's going to be a bigger deal than we want it to be, especially when we're trying to get out of that hole. So doing this pretty 
significant fasting routine on a regular basis and you've been doing it for 18 months, it looks like, that might be a little bit too much. That might be keeping you from being able to heal your adrenals, which then is also keeping you from being able to heal your insulin, which is really backwards because there's a lot of people who use a fasting protocol to work on their blood sugar. And if it's not working, that's why. More than likely, it's because your body is too stressed out. So if you can back off from that a little and see if maybe you can either fast a little less frequently, not as long. I mean, maybe a 12-hour fast overnight is all you need. And it really, you're already using keto. You're already getting the benefits of having the low-carbohydrate plan in your day of fasting. So those are very comparable already and what they're doing for your insulin resistance. So to put your body into this state of stress unnecessarily is probably not the best idea right now. So I would take that out a little bit, eat a little something when you wake up and see how that helps, especially because you have low cortisol in the morning. Man, if you start eating breakfast, that will shoot right up. I guarantee it. So work on that for a little bit. And then once you feel better and you've tested your adrenals and they're back to being healthy, then you can work on the fasting protocol again. All right, next one. What do you do for ketosis and insomnia? I've been keto for almost two years and have been having really bad insomnia. Waking up around two o'clock every night and if I fall back to sleep, it's around six. Do I up the carbs, lower the carbs, eat before bed? And then there's actually a similar question. I'm going to kind of answer them in a bundle here. This next question, I've been working on only eating when I'm hungry, but my doctor wants me to try having a snack at 9 p.m., thinking this might help with my sleep. Could I be waking up in the night because my body is making glucose? Two kind of different questions, but very similar answers. They're both asking about insomnia and why they're waking up at night and how do they keep that from happening? And there's a few questions that I have back to these people in order to know why they're waking up at night. My first question is, are you in ketosis? So not just are you eating low carb, high fat keto diet, but are you in ketosis? So that's there's a big difference nowadays in the keto community between eating keto and being in ketosis. So we really want to make sure that you are actually producing ketones. You're in a really good spot. You're seeing all the benefits of being in ketosis during the day. That's my first question. Because if you aren't and you're just kind of in this what I call low carb purgatory, then that right there could be your answer. Just make sure you're actually bumped up into producing ketones. So that will most likely be eating a little bit more fat for a period of time to produce ketones. And then you shouldn't have a problem. My next question is, are you eating enough food? So this is the main thing that I see in all of the women I have worked with that have had trouble sleeping. And it's actually probably the first thing that women in the fat burning female project experience like that first week is better sleep because they're eating the right amount of food for their bodies. They're actually fueling their bodies appropriately. So my very first question when I see anybody who's not sleeping, whether they're keto or not, is how much food are you eating? Are you properly fueling your body with the appropriate amount of nutrients that we as these really intricate females need throughout the day? If you're not, if you're kind of still in this diet mentality trying to restrict, maybe you're skipping a meal or two here or there trying to fast as it's part of your keto thing, that could be why too. It could be, again, as simple as that. Having a little bit more food at your meals will get you sleeping through the night. Next thing, which is kind of related, is are you going to bed hungry? So if you eat dinner at 5 o'clock at night and you're hungry by 10 o'clock then that could be waking you up and that will wake you up because you're hungry. You're going to bed unfueled. And we, it's not like we want to go to bed with this full stomach still digesting by any means. But if you need a little bit of a snack, which is one of the questions here is, do I just need to eat a snack before bed? We'll kind of get into that more. But And then lastly, do you have blood sugar issues? So if you are already dealing with some blood sugar issues, and maybe that's why you're in this keto space, then it's going to be perhaps something that while you're healing those blood sugar responses, then you may still notice that they wake you up at night. It may almost be kind of like a healing reaction that's happening with your blood sugar as it's trying to regulate itself during the day and overnight. 
So these are the questions I ask. And the reason I ask these questions is because when you wake up at night, it is a blood sugar slash cortisol response. So again, we just talked about in the last question how intricately connected our blood sugar handling is with our cortisol response and our adrenal health. So if you get into this place where you get into kind of a low blood sugar state, you know, we have this roller coaster effect that happens with our blood sugar. If it becomes low, then it's going to cause a cortisol response to help it get back up to its normal where it should be. So help us get to a normal blood sugar level. And that cortisol response wakes you up. You can think of it as like your energy driver, your gas pedal. So you're putting on the gas pedal at night because your blood sugar has dropped a little bit because you're hungry, because you didn't eat enough, (laughs) because you're not in ketosis, you're in low carb purgatory. So that's why I ask all those questions. So to answer these more specifically, they're saying, do I need to eat before bed? Do I need to eat more carbs? It could be any of the above. It could be that you, like I said, just need to eat more food overall. And you can do so by either increasing the amount of food that you're having at every meal and just not, still not eating before bed. Or it could be that you do have kind of a bedtime snack. And that's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with snacking before bed if you're hungry. I'd rather you go to bed feeling satisfied than go to bed hungry and wake up at night and not be able to get back to sleep. That's way more detrimental to your health than it is to eat a little bit of food before bed. Now, you just want to make sure that there's been enough time between that snack and actually trying to get to sleep for digestion. So you don't want to eat a snack while you're (laughs) getting ready to get into bed because you're going to be digesting your food while you're trying to sleep and that's also not going to be good. So give it, I would say maybe two hours, an hour and a half, you know, give a little bit of time to digest and then you should be just fine. I don't think there's anything wrong with needing a snack if it's going to help you sleep well. You'll want to make sure that that snack is balanced. It doesn't need to be all fat. It doesn't need to be all protein. It doesn't need to be all carbs. Maybe there's a good balance. That's why I usually recommend something like a nut butter because it does have a really good balanced ratio of macronutrients. There could be the possibility too that you do need more carbs in your day. It's totally dependent on you. It's dependent on how you handle carbohydrates. It's dependent on your blood sugar issues that you may currently have. But It's worth a try. It's worth adding in some carbs, maybe with your dinner, even in just a bite or two. I don't know how deep into ketosis you are or you want to be or what you're working on, but if it works in your keto equation to have some carbs at night, have them and see how that goes too. So there's a lot of different things you can try. It's all going to be dependent on each individual person, but that's kind of what's happening and what you can do about it potentially. Before we move on with this episode, let me just take a minute to remind you all about the healing power of bone broth, and more specifically, Oh So Good Bone Broth, who is a proud Keto for Women sponsor. Bone broth is the best, most nutrient-dense way that you can go to heal your body and heal your gut and improve your skin and nails and hair. The amino acid profile in bone broth is absolutely incredible, something we all need and a lot of us miss on a regular basis. Not to mention those micronutrients, the vitamins and minerals also provided naturally in bone broth that work to heal your gut and also to to heal your immune system and to keep you healthy and well. That's why we are recommended to drink broth when we're sick or when we feel ourselves getting sick. And to have that in a package that is so delicious and so easy, all you have to do is grab a pack of oh so good bone broth out of your freezer, let it thaw, put it into a pot and you can use it either in recipes for whatever you're making that day or my personal favorite is to just drink it straight out of a mug. It's very comforting and warm. I love to do it before bed. It's kind of my nighttime ritual. It calms me down, makes sure that I'm nice and healthy heading into bedtime and I have those nutrients ready to go. Oh So Good Bone Broth is 100% the best tasting broth out there. It is the best one I have ever had. I've tried them all. I'm really... 
I am a huge fan of the flavors of the bone broth that they have there at Oh So Good. My favorite is the Signature. I highly recommend that. A close second is the Spicy Pork. So make sure when you are placing your order with Oh So Good, you grab those two and just give them a try. Let me know if you think they're your favorite too. And just make sure you always have some around. I know uh, you can make your own, but there's just times when all of a sudden you or your family member feels like they're coming down with something and you need some broth immediately, but you don't have any bones. You don't have the time to make some broth. And it's just really nice to have that in the freezer ready to go for whenever you or your family needs it, which really, honestly, it's an everyday thing. You need to be making this a ritual so that it gets into your health care routine because it is a much needed part of that. So head to ohsogoodbones.com and get $10 off your order when you use the code KETO, the number for women. That's O-S-S-O goodbones.com and use the coupon code KETO, the number for women to place your order, get $10 off. Make sure to try all those flavors. Try the soups too. They are phenomenal and so easy to pull out and have around for a quick dinner. Uh, Just so great. Everything's so good there. I promise you're going to be obsessed. Moving on. Hi, Sean. My question to you is, is keto a sustainable lifestyle? I've been keto for about three months and have been spreading the word about the benefits of this lifestyle from what I've learned listening to your podcast. I get a lot of questions about whether or not keto is sustainable and that it causes more harm than good in the long run. So these kinds of questions I get often, and it's one of the reasons why I recorded last week's episode about how long should you do keto. And it's Really just because, I mean, I guess the answer that I have is it depends and we don't really know. (laughs) So these people that are saying that it's not sustainable don't have any information about whether it's sustainable or not because we in the keto community don't really have any information about whether it's sustainable or not, at least as far as it goes from a research perspective, from a scientific study perspective, because there aren't long-term studies on keto. There aren't any studies that have been done on people that have been in ketosis for 20, 30, 40 years. So we don't know the sustainability piece. Now, we do have the anecdotal evidence of people that have been in ketosis for 15, 20 years, perhaps, and feeling really good and having really good success with their health. But, you know, that's kind of what we're putting our hat on right now is just that anecdotal evidence, which I think is really great. And it's kind of enough for me to say that it's sustainable. But what we really want to consider when we talk about sustainability is if you think it's sustainable. If you have gotten to your place with your keto lifestyle, that you do think you could do it for the long term, that it is something that you consider more of a lifestyle than a diet. That's really what we care about here on Keto for Women and in the keto community, I think too, is just finding that spot where we feel really good, where our health markers are improving, where the symptoms that we had been experiencing pre-keto are gone or leaving in their own way. And that's how we can tell if it's sustainable or not for us. And then once you're there at that point, it doesn't really matter what other people say, does it? Because you're doing what's right for you. You feel really good. You are getting healthier and healthier by the day. And you can kind of just brush off what they say. And I think eventually they'll just kind of get sick of talking about it and leave you alone. That's kind of what has happened in my world, and it just doesn't matter. It's totally dependent on what you think your body will like now and in the future, and that can change day by day. Right now, you know you like keto. It's working for you. Tomorrow, maybe it won't be, and that's why I created the podcast I did last week so we have that resource of how to know if that changes because it might change for some people. Maybe it won't, and that's great, but maybe it will. So just know that you're doing the right thing for you if you think it's sustainable. Next one, how to increase testosterone levels without medications. Love this question too, because testosterone is something that 
I don't think that many of us women really question or take a peek at or want to know more about in our bodies because we don't think we have that much of it and it's not that important. But I can tell you that it is extremely important. No, we don't have as much testosterone as a man, but we have enough to where if it is low or if it's high, it's going to cause issues for you. And this particular question is talking about low testosterone. If you have low testosterone, you will have a poor libido. You'll be unable to gain muscle. You will have no energy. You won't be able to even improve in your workouts. There's just a lot of things that you will feel with low testosterone. So if you want to increase it, again, we have to talk about working out. So let's all just work out right now. That'd be great. Let's do it. Lifting weights and putting some actual strain on your muscle in order to gain more muscle mass is the best and quickest way to increase your testosterone. It will be like magic almost when that happens. So really try to incorporate some weightlifting into your workout routine if you're not already doing that. And again, make sure it's at enough of a intensity level to break down those muscle fibers so they repair and rebuild even stronger. That's the whole point of lifting weights and building strength. That's what's happening. So get to that point with your workouts. Next, balance your blood sugar. So if you have imbalanced blood sugar, particularly in the high category, then you have high testosterone. Well, the same thing can happen if you tend more towards low blood sugar or just, you know, pretty decent blood sugar swings. Again, very connected to your adrenal health, which also means it's very connected to your sex hormone health. So balancing your blood sugar will be really great to improve all of your sex hormone readings, whether you're low in estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, all of the above, high in any of the above, or just imbalanced in any of the above. That's why keto is so great for our hormones in general is because we're balancing that blood sugar. You're going to reduce stress also. So again, that adrenal health really matters when it comes to the downstream effect that it has on your sex hormones. So just by really working on your stress, all of the things I talked about a few questions ago when I discussed things you can do to reduce your stress, do that also if you want to improve, again, not just testosterone levels, but all of your hormone levels really need to work on your stress levels. And lastly, get good sleep. It's like all the same answers that I had for this other question when we're talking about healing our adrenals and insulin resistance. The same thing applies for your hormones too, because it all comes back to really having that nice, healthy adrenal response with nice, healthy cortisol rhythms. When we have that, things balance out. It's quite fascinating and quite simple, but yet so difficult at the same time. All right, next one. I'm not sure if you have covered this before, but which hormones that affect mainly women are most impacted by the keto lifestyle? So again, we're talking cortisol, we're talking estrogen and progesterone, we're talking our thyroid hormones, and we're even talking about our hunger satiety hormones, leptin and ghrelin. I think these are some of the biggest ones impacted by keto. And just a note, men have all of these also, but we're talking about women. And specifically when we are talking women, I like to focus on the estrogen and progesterone ratio, because that is the dance, I kind of like to think of it, that can quickly go awry in women that are stressed out, that are dealing with some sort of stressor, having some sort of adrenal issue. So if we're talking estrogen progesterone, like I mentioned, I think of it as a dance because every single day of every single month of our cycle as women, these two hormones do this like little dance with each other and it's different every single day. And if any of those days go awry or get off balance or they start doing a different dance, like someone's doing the waltz and someone's doing like hip hop, then you're going to feel it. You're going to see it. You will notice it. Something will be up. You will not be feeling as good as you should. So those are the two that I really like to focus on, but it does all come from this downstream effect of cortisol. So like I said, Stress is the reason for these to go awry quite often. 
And that's why I talk about it with keto because for me, and this is you know a big piece of the Keto for Women show, keto has two different ways it can go. It can get into this place of being really stressful on the body, and then we are dealing with cortisol issues. We're dealing with estrogen, progesterone issues and imbalances. We're dealing with thyroid issues, and we're dealing with leptin and ghrelin issues. Or it can be a really healthy healing protocol when done kind of in the proper way for us as women, and it can be healing for cortisol levels, healing for estrogen and progesterone levels, better for thyroid health, and really stabilize the leptin and ghrelin responses that we have. So that's why I personally really try to get women into this place of not causing a stress response in their bodies by going keto. It will really affect all of the hormones we're talking about, but specifically this estrogen progesterone balance that I see in 95% of the people that I work with is off. So we can really work to balance that out with keto when done properly. And we talk about what that means all the time here, but just as a quick recap, that means eating enough nutrient dense foods, focusing on real foods, taking your time to get into ketosis and to change up your macronutrient ratios, listening to your body to determine what your version of keto is, making sure you're actually in ketosis and not just in low carb purgatory, all these things we talk about here all the time. All right, next one. What are your thoughts about using CBD oil for helping with anxiety, joint pain, and inflammation? Ooh, another good question. Well, I live in Colorado, so there's lots of CBD oil available pretty much on every street corner. But I think it is great, especially for those things that you listed above. So there are actual like really great studies with really great evidence showing that CBD oil does help immensely with things like anxiety and other mood disorders, joint pain, and really other types of pain. It really does connect with the pain receptors and inflammation. It is extremely anti-inflammatory too. So yeah, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence out there of people that are using CBD and having great responses, but there's also that scientific research to back it up too. So I really think it is a great option for a lot of people, especially if If you are someone, and again, I see this really often in the ladies I work with, that a lot of people are still pretty reliant on NSAIDs like Tylenol, aspirin, Advil, those types of drugs to get them through their menstrual cycles or through their headaches or joint pain and things like that, where we could be turning to something like CBD oil to help with that instead and not have to worry about the repercussions of using these types of over-the-counter pills like on our gut health and our microbiome and things like that. So really great options. I'm not sure if it's totally available to everyone for purchase in the U.S. or throughout the world. I don't know the status on that. Again, here in Colorado, you can get it anywhere, but I know that's not the case for most states. So you'd have to check and see if it's something you can buy online. That might be the case if you can't get it in your state. So you'll have to check in on that. I know it's different state to state too. So, but great question. All right, we'll do one more. I really like this question too. I'm new to the keto world and would like to know an easy way to start that doesn't take a lot of time. What would an eating day look like? What fats, proteins, and veggies would I use for an easy five-day quick start? I like this question. This is, again, I think a question I could do a whole episode about because it's so fun. But my quick answer is this. I see this quite often. People start keto and they buy all the keto cookbooks, they make all the keto recipes, they're on all the keto blogs, and it gets overwhelming really quickly, and you stop doing it. I really don't think that, of course, there's great recipes out there, but I really don't think it's necessary or even in the best interest to start by you making all the keto recipes. I think it's much better for the first week or two to just go really basic. So go to the store, get your basic oils. So coconut oil, avocado oil, olive oil, 
some other animal fat like butter, ghee, tallow, something along those lines. So you have all the staples for your fat. Get some eggs, get some bacon, grass-fed beef, salmon, sausage if you can find a good brand. So you have all your proteins ready to go. Get the veggies that you want for the week or the next few weeks. And then grab some things that you could use as snacks like nut butters, super high quality dark chocolate, macadamia nuts, avocados, things like that. So you're all set with the basics. And then meal prep. So take your basics and prep them so you already have everything ready to go. You can make some mayo and or ranch dressing from the recipe I have on my website if you'd like, but make a few different kinds of sauces perhaps or dressings, something that you can use to flavor things up and get more fats. Cook up your beef, maybe some other sort of meat you can have throughout the week, and maybe you could even roast your veggies or saute your veggies so they're already pre-made if that's something you want to do too. And then you're basically just taking these components and making different plates out of them. And by the way, this is what I do pretty much 99% of the time. I have some sort of meat. A lot of times it's a leftover, so I put some meat on my plate I have veggies, I either cook them up at the time or they're leftovers, I put some of those on my plate, I add some sort of sauce or mayo or dressing to that, and that's my plate of food. And it really can be that easy, and I think should be that easy for your kickstart for the first couple of days that you're trying to do keto, is don't worry about all these fancy recipes, don't try to make all these like desserts and everything, just go really basic have some foods around that you like to have as snacks just in case you get hungry and you'll be good to go for those first couple weeks. So then you can move on and make all of these awesome keto recipes that are out there. There's probably like almost a billion now, so you shouldn't have any problem. All right. We are going to wrap it up here, friends. Thank you so much as always for joining me. I will chat with you next week. And until then, if you happen to have a spare moment or two, I would love to hear from you over on iTunes. If you could leave a review for the show, let me know what you're loving. I would so appreciate it. I check everyone and I love hearing from you all and getting to know what you like about the show. Thanks so much, ladies. And we'll talk to you next time. Bye.